So the last few weeks we've been doing a study on uh, the acts uh, of the apostles, the Christians, the first Christians in the book of Acts, and we've called it viral, viral. I, I almost uh, said, Rory, we got to be careful with that because we don't want people to think we're saying virus. We're saying viral. This thing has gone viral. So tonight we're going to endeavor to do that. Let me just give you a little refresher. In week one, I spoke to you about the church being spirit-empowered, about how they were filled with the Spirit and it empowered them to turn the world upside down. Last week, Brother Roy did such a phenomenal job talking about the Christ-centered church of the book of Acts, the early Christians using uh, the symbol of the fish because they identified themselves with the identity of Christ and how that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him bodily and we are complete in Him. Tonight, Tonight we're going to take that up, and this time we're going to talk in week three on uh, the book of Acts church, but we're going to talk about them being mission-minded. Everybody say mission-minded. So that's, uh, we're just going to take up right where we left off, and, and Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. What a great time we had here Sunday, and uh, I preached a little bit about the Spirit of God, the promise and the power of the Holy Ghost. And we still believe in that, amen? We still believe people receive that experience, amen? And I'm glad to tell you that I'm a part of that people that have received that experience. And I believe God's going to pour out His Spirit upon the whole earth. I believe that, amen? Beginning, beginning tonight, uh, in the beginning matter, it's, here's what I would like to say. It's tough to overcome a bad start. You know, I told our ushers and hostess many times through the years when people come into our church, you only get one shot at making a good impression. You only get one time to make the, the first impression is often a lasting impression. You know what I'm talking about because you've just met people that within 30 seconds you decided you didn't like them. Don't you look at me like that. Every one of us have done that. And we've kind of wrote them off whether we really knew them or not. And that's really not fair, is it? But first impressions are lasting impressions. But tonight, let me, let me just talk to you about the book of Acts church because it, it, was, it was tough if you got off on a bad start. But the book of Acts church came with a blaze of glory. It started with fire. It started with anointing. It started with the power of God moving upon those people in Acts chapter 2. So, so when, you, when you talk about beginning matters, you, you, it, it's just like a, a runner that starts and he stumbles out of the gate. Well, then it's almost impossible for him to win the race. If you take a marriage that is dishonest in the beginning, it often erupts into trouble somewhere down the road. It's often hard to overcome a bad start. And tonight, tonight, I want to tell you that the church had a glorious start and the church will have a glorious ending. I read the back of the book and we win. No matter what, we win. Amen? The church will be okay. So you, you, you got many small sayings to illustrate things like a bad start. We, we, have you ever heard anybody say, well, the early bird gets the worm? Anybody ever heard that saying? That's to get off to a good start. Setting the tone or starting your day off right or the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step in the right direction. All of these just implicate what I'm talking about tonight is beginning matters, getting off to a good start. And from the earliest moments of the church, when the church was born in Acts chapter 2, the church, the tone was set. They sold out to the Lord. They gave everything they had to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not, oh, well, do we really want to do this? It was completely and totally sold out. You know, they were instructed by the Lord to wait for the promise of the Father, and they were also told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The mission was very clear. Jesus was leaving his legacy 
of ministry behind to the 12 that he had chosen along with the others that gathered in an upper room, about 120. Remember what we talked to you about several times in the last two or three weeks. The Bible said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall be endued with power from on high when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. So what was happening here was Jesus got his church off to a blazing start. It was 120 believers, and before the day of Pentecost was over, it was 3,000 believers added to the 120. As a matter of fact, if you study history, you will find that before the first persecution in the book of Acts church, there were 87,000 people estimated to be believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a fast-growing church. It was Thessalonica that said, be careful for these are they that turn the world upside down. You want something to go viral? Nothing went viral like the gospel of Jesus Christ, like the message of the power of God that came in the book of Acts. It was from that 120 to 3,000 and then to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, and all through the book of God, the church. Let me tell you, you couldn't stop them. They would try to persecute the church in the early days and they would, they would cause them to disperse. But when they dispersed, wherever those Christians landed, it was like hot coals in, in dry timber. A fire would break out. A revival would break out. Some miracle would start to happen. They were mission-minded. Everybody say mission-minded. The early church embraced the mission of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to talk about it a little bit tonight because that's very, very important. They had an enduring sense of mission about them and a corresponding commitment to the mission that God gave them to carry out. He instructed his disciples very plainly and very vividly. I want you to take the gospel to the world. Go ye into all the world. That's the words of Jesus. And teach all nations. That's missionary work. And I want to tell you that this is exactly what they did. They gave their voices to the message. They gave their lives to his will. They preached. They reached. They gave. They went. They gave their, their bodies, their health, their minds, their talents, their abilities. They gave their money. They gave everything. They were, they were sold out to the mission of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul the Apostle Paul was, was writing to the church and he made a compelling statement that well describes the mindset of the early church. Here's what he said in Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven or making peace by the blood of his cross. Now Paul described this this way or Jesus this way. He said he is before all things, superior to all things, above all things and by him all things consist and through him all things are reconciled to God. So this was the mindset of the first church. The mission of Christ was not to come and cause himself to be popular among the people of the day. He didn't come to write a book besides the Bible. He didn't come to, to set up on the pedestal of society and make himself of great renown. What he came for was to seek and save the lost. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 19 verse 10. The Bible said, for Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Does anybody believe that? That is the mission of Jesus. The cross was about the lost. The cross was our, was our ticket to salvation. The blood of Jesus was shed for his mission. His mission was to come, to seek, to save. The early church was consumed with that mission. 
They knew that mission, continuing the work of God in their time. The early Christians wrote about Jesus. They gave, they gave a scripture. They sang songs about him. They worshiped him. They shared his life-changing love with everybody around them. They preached Christ and him crucified everywhere they went. Go look at the, the sermon that Simon Peter preached to those first people on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room and I preached about it Sunday. You know what he preached? He preached Christ and him crucified. He preached the love of God to them. And I want to tell you that's what they were consumed with. God's kingdom was their mission. They were mission-minded. Say it again with me, mission-minded. That's why they met every day. They prayed together. They broke bread together. They taught doctrine together. Jesus was the overwhelming message of their life. Their devotion was a living example of what Jesus was. It was, it was what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 because he told them this. He said, seek ye first. I want you to note, note this scripture. You ought to go underline it in your Bible. It's in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said to them, teaching them on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. What things? Well, he just talked about clothing. He just talked about food. He said, the, the, the bird, the fowl of the air don't have to worry. God takes care of them. The lily of the field don't have to worry. God takes care of them. He's going to clothe you. He's going to feed. Here's what your mission is. You seek God first. I wonder what would happen if every one of us in this room caught that vision and caught that mentality, that number one, before our job, before, before a paycheck, before anything else in this world, and I could name a lot of stuff, before a hobby, before anything that we do, Jesus Christ first. I hope it is that way with you because he said if you seek him first and you seek his kingdom and you seek his righteousness, everything else is going to be okay. Does anybody believe that tonight? You put it in God, you put God in the rightful place, everything else is going to be okay. Their devotion was that living example of that scripture. And when in everything is first in your life and in my life, I'm going to tell you we become mission-minded because we get the mind of Christ. Paul said in one place, he said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Do you know what the mind of Christ was? To save people. That's what he came for. Save people. And so if you get the mind of Christ, when we think of missions, sometimes we think of missionaries. Now, if God called me to a foreign country, he better be sure he calls Arlene too. Because I'm going to tell you, she probably ain't going without an audible voice of God. And then he'd have to reemphasize it and say it twice. I'm just telling you. Because, because that's not an easy thing to leave your family, to leave your homeland, to leave the, the comfort and the, the, the wonderful things that we enjoy here in America. I'm glad I live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Is there anybody glad to be an American here tonight? With all of its faults, listen to me, it's still the greatest place on earth. Don't you ever forget that. Amen. If you don't love it and you like somewhere else better, you need to pack up and go there and you'll soon be coming home. Amen. So is that, is that Christianity, uh, the, the, the reality is that Christianity didn't spread just by missionaries. Now, Paul had a missionary journey. You can go study. He had three of them. You can go study the missionary journeys of Paul in the Scripture. Am I right? So they believed in missionaries. But the reality is that Christianity didn't spread across the world by missionaries but was carried to the masses by everyday believers. That's the way it happens. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to talk to us for just the next few minutes. I got, I got 24 minutes, and I'm going to let you out of here. But I want you to hear me in what I got to say tonight, okay? They took the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to their homes, to their friends, to their co-workers. When God changed their lives... Through the preaching of the gospel, they shared the treasure they had found with those around them. This is the way the gospel spread. Early Christians, and this is in your little sheet of paper. You can put down the first blank there. Early Christians were 
informal missionaries. Now, let me talk about that word. A man by the name of Michael Green wrote a book on evangelism in the early church, and uh, he, he shows that early Christianity's explosive growth was in reality accomplished by the means of informal missionaries. That is, Christian lay people, not trained preachers and evangelists, but people that carried on the mission of the church, not through just a formal revival or formal preaching, or, but informal conversation around the dinner table, in the home, in the shops, on the sidewalks, in the marketplace. They did it naturally. They did it enthusiastically. Having found treasure, they meant to share it with others to the limit of their ability. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is informal missionaries. That's what we are. We're, you don't have to be called to preach to be a missionary. You don't have to have a call upon your life. You have a call upon your life if you're a child of God because he said, you're going to be my witnesses. He didn't say that to just the preachers. He said that to the congregation. Matter of fact, there were 500 that heard him say that. 500 stood on the mount when he was ascended back up into glory. Talk about a church split. You want to know one? Jesus lost 380 from the time he ascended to the upper room. He only had 120 show up in the upper room. He had 500 standing on the mount when he was there. Somebody said, why are they leaving? I don't know. They just didn't want to pay the price. But 120 said, I want, I want what he promised. I want what he has for me. I want what God's got. And so they spread the gospel as informal missionaries. Let me talk to you tonight about how to be a mission-minded person in a modern world. How to be mission-minded in a modern world. You see, evangelism, make evangelism a personal, and put this in your notes, priority. It's got to become a priority. Now look, now watch me real close here. Somebody asked me not long ago, is it true that people can be so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. I don't know, but I suspect so. I hope you don't judge me for that. I want you to love God. I want you to think about God. I want you to pray to God. I want you to talk about God. But you can't talk about God 24 hours a day. People ain't going to want to be around you. That or not, I just said it. It's okay to be godly. It's okay to be spiritual. Sometimes you need to laugh. Sometimes you need to go fishing. Sometimes you need to sit around the supper table and laugh about things that happen in your life. Just being honest. But on the other hand, God has to be the priority of your life. And, and evangelism has to be the ultimate goal. Let me tell you something. You will never win anybody until you become their friend. They're going to trust you before you can win them. They want to they see what you are and know what you are before they move in your direction. You don't save people. I don't save. Look, preaching is good. I'm going to give you some statistics in a minute. Bible said you got to have a preacher. I believe in the ministry. I believe in the five-fold ministry. I believe in apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists. I believe in all of that. I believe there's a place for that. But let me tell you who the greatest soul winners and missionaries are. It's you. It's people in this church. It's for us to come here and get full and go out. The church ought to be a place not to come to but to go from. Now, now hear me. Everybody ought to come so you can fill up and go out and be an informal missionary and watch for an opening and watch for a time and watch for a place and make it a priority when the opening comes that you're ready. You can't look, I love chocolate pie. I love lemon pie. I love strawberry pie, but I don't like none of it smashed in my face. Amen. Still with me? Still preaching, Brother Steve. You with me back there? Okay. He sent me a note Sunday after I got through. said, I thought you'd quit preaching, but I'm glad to see you hadn't. He always picking on me. I told him, you know what I told him? You ain't get rid of me that easy. But here's the facts. You, you, you can't just, I know a man 
that when he got in the church, every breath, every breath was, was Jesus. He, 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 look, he just took, let me say it this way. He just took it overboard. And, 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 and nobody, you know, you just felt uncomfortable even being around him because I want to talk about the Lord. I want the things of God. But I also want to be common in this world to where people can say, hey, I want, I want to live like he's living. I want to, I want to give like he's giving. I want to be a part of whatever he has. And to, to, the first thing you have to do is, it to, is to put it as a priority and watch for an opening. Here's what the Timothy model is. Second Timothy 2 and 2, Paul said to Timothy, that young man, that young preacher, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul taught Timothy, a young pastor, to take what he'd learned and received from Paul and entrust it to faithful men whom he would equip and train to teach others also. This was the growth model of the first church, to take personal responsibility, to share the things that you have learned, to, to be ready to give every, the Bible said, be ready to give every man an answer. You need to know why we believe in, in, in Jesus Christ. You need to know why we believe in worship. You need to know why we believe what we believe. You need to know that. If you're going to say, I believe there's one God, you need to know why you believe there's one God. If you're going to say, I'm a Christian and I want to live like Jesus, why do you want to live like that? So you got to, the Bible said, be ready to give every man an answer. And this is what Paul was saying to Timothy. You share what I've given to you with other men, entrusted and faithful men. And when Jesus said, go, he was talking to me and to you. And so we got to go. Amen? It's not general, it's personal. When God saved you, you became one of his spokesmen. But you have to be careful. Here's what Jesus told the disciples one day. Watch, with, watch this. He said to them this statement. You go and you be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You ever dissected that scripture? Wise as serpents. Let me tell you what a serpent would do. He will wait till a precise moment. Am I right? A snake. You want me to preach about snakes, Erling? Mm -mm. So you got to know when to strike. And let me tell you something else. You don't bite anybody to harm them like the serpent does. You be harmless as doves. That's wisdom from the master. That's what he told his disciples. You go and you be wise as serpents and you be harmless as doves. He said to them this. He said in the New Testament, you are a city on a hill. You are light in darkness. You are the salt of the earth. Does you know what salt is? Salt is a preservative. Salt is... It's what keeps things. It, it preserves. Let me tell you what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to be here when the world's dark like it is right now. The church is supposed to shine bright. You, 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 we're, we're a city on a hill. We're a beacon to a lost boat out there. We are sought to preserve truth and preserve righteousness. You're filled with the Spirit so that you can be the powerful witness that God wants you to be. How do you have a viral impact on a modern world? I'll tell you what you do. You make evangelism a personal priority. And you make, let me tell you, my Brother Roy and I were talking today, and we'll get into something in just a minute. I won't have time to do it. And, and, and I want to hurry to that. But what would happen in this very congregation? What would happen if every person, every person won one person to God in 2020? I wonder, have you thought about it? If you could just get one, make it your goal to win one person by December the 31st of 2020 to win them to Christ and to show them the way. And you know what would happen? This social distancing wouldn't be going too good in here, I can tell you. Just one person. If everybody, we used to have a, a, a deal 
years ago, they came out with a program, Each One Reach One. Well, what if that happened? What if we made it a goal? What if that became a priority? You talk about a viral impact in a modern world as believers. There, there's, there's some people, listen to me, there's some people that only you can reach. Here's the second thing you got to do it, to how to be a mission-minded person in a modern world. Watch this. Use the power of personal story. Personal story. Everybody's got a story. I can't give all your stories today. Somebody said, well, I don't know the scripture. Do you know what God done for you? Do you know where he brought you from? Do you know how far he picked you up? Do you know where you were when God found you? Can you tell your story? Because you know what, everywhere the apostle Paul went, he just told his story. He just said, here's my story. Here's, what, here's my testimony. The early church reached, look, the Bible wasn't even through being written. So they didn't have all the scriptures you have. What they had was a story. Let me tell you what God did for me. A man with an argument. Listen to me. I said it before. I say it again. I'm going to keep saying a man with an argument is always at the mercy of a man with an experience. You can't tell me I didn't get it. You got an argument, I got an experience. You can't tell me what didn't happen to me. I know where God brought me from. We got drug addicts in this place that used to be drug addicts that are drug addicts no more. We got alcoholics that used to be alcoholics that are alcoholics no more because Jesus picked them up out of the miry clay and he set their fear a rock and he changed their life. You talk about a story. We got folks from all walks of life and all we have to do is start telling our story. Oh, I hope you get it tonight. Use the power of your personal story. The best tool, this is in your notes, you have for reaching the lost is your personal testimony. Your personal testimony. And then the third thing is this. Reach people with your proximity, within your proximity. Have you ever noticed how people do things in groups? Have you ever noticed that you can go to a, some kind of event, and, and I'm just going to use names here, and Sally gets up and says, I need to go to the bathroom. And the rest of the girls go too. It's just a group thing. Come on now. Men don't like to fish by themselves, most of them. They got to have somebody to go with them. We don't do hobbies by ourselves, Harley. Cars, hunting, fishing, whatever. I don't want to go by myself. I want to go with somebody. You ever noticed how people do things in groups? You see, we tend to be attached to things that people, to the people that we are close to are, are attached to and introduce us to. The greatest times of the Chance family, I'm going to say this without reservations, the greatest time in my home through, through the years of my life the greatest time with my kids and now my grandkids is a glass table in a dining room where we sit down and eat from time to time and we don't stay 30 minutes. I'm not exaggerating. Sometime four and five hours. Am I telling the truth? You know why? Because we're family and we talk about things at the dinner table. The gospel spreads most quickly to those who are in your close proximity. It's called oikos. Remember this word, O-I-K-O-S, oikos evangelism, okay? It's reaching your household. I, I don't know how many revivals, Mother, you could tell about this, but through the years through this church, how many families have come? And when it, it, you know, one catalyst of the family would, would come to God. And the first thing you know, here comes the brother, and here comes the sister, and here comes the mother, or the father, or the cousin, or the uncle. And, you, you know, I mean, we got a whole master's clan up here. They didn't get here by accident. We, we've, had, we've had, I could go through and just tell you families, families that came by families. Revival brought family after family after family because that is your greatest influence. 
It's, it's with your blood relatives. It's with your clients. It's with your friends. It's with your close associates. It's with people that you rub shoulders with every day. The husband comes, then the wife comes, or the wife comes, and then the husband comes, or the kids come, and then the family comes. I've always told our, our teachers, when you get the kids, you get the parents normally because they're going where the kids are. Families are close-knit. God intended for it to be that way. But oikos is reaching out to those in close proximity. It's reaching those whom you, you rub shoulders with every day. Day. I want to get to some statistics right quick. I have a few minutes, and, and I, there, there's a whole lot I need to say. But let me pull my glasses out because I want, you to, I want you to hear this. Who reaches who? Who reaches who? And how are people influenced to receive Jesus or attend church? Here's the statistics. And I didn't notice this, Brother Rory, but the information was provided by the guy by the name of Wynn Arn. In the 1990s, I went to a seminar, a church growth seminar in Dallas, Texas, by the Win Arm Institute, and Win Arm was there, and he taught, and I didn't realize he's the one that put these statistics out, but they were true then, they are true now, and I want you to hear them. Who reaches who? How are people influenced to receive Jesus or attend your church? Initiated by pastor or church staff? is zero to three percent. Visitation, we all believe in that. One half to one percent. Small group activity, four to six percent. Church programs, two to four percent. These are statistics that are proven. These people study church growth in America. All denominations. This is what they say. Benevolent efforts or special needs. In other words, you help people. One to three percent. Uninvited visit. That's when people just walk in. Two to four percent. Special services or big events. Like friend day. One half to one percent. Watch this. Friends slash relatives slash associates. You ready? Seventy-five to 90% of people came to church because of friends, relatives, associates. Mission life. Who can you save around you? What if you got your mama or your daddy or your sister or your brother or your cousin or your aunt or the associate at work? People that work for you or with you. Does this church believe in missions? You better believe it. We don't crow about it, but every month, every month we support over 75 foreign missionaries around the world. We have home missionaries around the cities of America, the large cities that we support. We support our, our black evangelism in the United Pentecostal Church. We support, we give missions Missions, missions. We give to Mother's Memorial and She's for Christ and Save Our Children. All that's missions. We give thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every year to missions. I don't know where we are right now, but for a long time we were in the top 100 churches of giving in the whole fellowship that we're in. For years we've been there. Do we believe in missions? Yes, we believe in missions. But the greatest mission work we can do is for us to take this truth to our friends and our family. I wish I could just inspire you this evening to understand that the church, it's, 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 it's made up of families and associates and people. We have people that walk in off the street we have people that just show up. We have people that sometimes move in. Thank God for that. We do. But the greatest revivals that we have anytime, anywhere is when we bring our own to this church and we, we point them in the direction of the cross. I don't know about you, but I want to reach those around me. My daily prayer before, I'm going to be honest with you, before 
I pray for anything or anybody. I pray for myself to be saved. I pray for my wife to be saved. I pray for my children to be saved. I pray for my grandchildren to be saved. That's my family. That should be your priority too. We want to save others. We want to save the world. We want to reach out to the world. But I just wonder why you're sitting here tonight. And we're just, you know, the crowd's not large. and It's better than preachers to empty pews, so I can tell you that. But while we're sitting here and, and, and coming to the closing moments of this service, I wonder if you could just think of somebody. Well, I wonder, I wonder if old so-and-so would just come to church with me. You don't know till you ask. The greatest testimony you have is not what you say, it's what you do. It's your life. You can tell them all you want to. But if you just live in life and living it for God and living it good and walking right, people are noticing. You're the, you're the only Bible some folks will ever read. Are you aware of that? You're the only Bible that some folks will ever read. They'll never pick up the Scripture, but if they know you're a Christian, they're reading you, they're watching you. That's why I tell this church all the time, look, you can live for God 20 years and do right, but you can't go on a cuss rampant on Facebook. You've just destroyed 20 years worth of living for God. Don't need to be putting pictures up there either that aren't good. I don't know how I got off of that rabbit, but I feel like I got off on it on my purpose. You don't need to be posting stuff that's not good. You represent the church. You represent Jesus. Mission-minded. Look, do you know how many times I want to pick up my phone and start typing? And I have to bite this finger and say, shut up and don't do that. Because I'm mission my I, I don't want to offend people with words that could hurt from now on. I want, to, I want to make sure they see Jesus through me. You know what Jesus is? The love of God is more to me than all this world could ever be. He is love. He is light. The Bible said God is love. That's just a scripture. God is love. God is light. God is truth. God is righteous. God is kind. The gifts of the Spirit are the, the fruit of the Spirit. If you go read them, it's gentleness and kindness and meekness and temperance and love, mercy. Hello. So what I'm saying to you today is let's be mission-minded. Let's save those around us. Let's save people intentionally. Let's live our life intentionally. And when the time comes, say, hey, come go with me. How many of you are here tonight because a family member invited you or invited you to church? At any, at any time, place, at any time, a family member, look, look, all over. A friend, a close friend, associate, a family member, somebody took you to church or invited you to church, brought you here. Yeah. yeah. That's the reason you're here tonight, so you understand why I'm saying what I am. 75 to 90% of people that come to the church are brought by close friends, relatives, associates, that little connection of that world. If you can do other things as a group, go to church as a group. Shall we stand? It's 8 o'clock. I love you all. Thank you for being with me on Wednesday night. I love you. You make preaching so much better. And for those of you who are watching, we love you. Save your families. Save your household. Save your relatives. Give it your best shot. Someday, someday, we will all stand before God. And when he said, go ye, he wasn't just talking to the disciples. He wants us to go and to teach nations and to present this gospel. And he wants it to start at home. Let me tell you something. I just feel real bold right now. This church is not a prejudiced church. This church is not a racist church. 
We love every body from every skin color, from every nation. Everybody is the same here, and the Holy Ghost is the common denominator. Some of my closest and, and most fun people are not like me, but they love me, and I love them because the Holy Ghost makes us that way. The, de the design of God's church in the 21st century is for it to be a church. That's why the Bible said in the book of Revelation they were there from every nation under heaven. They're going to be there from everywhere. If you think there's going to be segregation in heaven, honey, you better go get your Bible and study. And God don't want it down here either. He wants us to love one another, to reach for everybody. I want every poor man, every rich man, every color man, whatever our, our nationalities are, this is the church. And God wants us in the church. This is his kingdom. And we're going to love everybody here. Amen. We're going to let, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. We're going to love everybody here. We're all going to love everybody here. If you don't love me, shame on you. It's, you're missing the best part of life. My, my, my. I love you all. God bless you. Sunday morning's going to be awesome. Don't you miss it. Come in here and don't shake nobody's hand. Just give them a wave and a smile. Elbow bump them. We'll get over it one day, I promise you. But come back Sunday and let's have a move with the Holy Ghost. God bless you this evening. Our ushers, our offering will be in the in the back. Go, go, ushers. Every door, you can put your offering in the plate as you go out. By the way, thank you so much for your wonderful contribution, your kindness to me last Sunday. I want to say thank you again. I'm getting older and I need every dime I get. God bless you. I love you all. Have a great, great week. Have a great week. I'll take that.